スケジュールに遅れが出ておりますので、あの我々の活動について、えー、少し,し紹介させていただければと思います。今回のシンポジウムが、えー、我々の第7回目のシンポジウムとなります。最初のシンポジウムはあの先ほどスクリーンで映し出されましたあのリズ・トラス元英国前英国首相を招いて、えー、行われた東大でのシンポジウムでございましたけれどもそちらが開催されたのがあちょうど昨年の2023年2月8日となりますで本日2月2024年2月7日ということでちょうど我々の活動の1周年にあたるシンポジウムでございます今後ともあの我々 ESPR といたしましてあの東大先端圏より日本の経済安全保障の環境に向けてインサイトを提供していく所存でございますのでどうぞ今後ともご支援いただけますようお願い申し上げます Thank you for your patience. We're now ready to commence the symposium organized by the ESPR at the University of Tokyo, titled、uh, Standardization of AI Safety, Risks, Opportunities, and International Cooperation. Firstly, we are honored to have an opening address from Director Sugiyama of the ARCAST at the University of Tokyo. Due to his busy schedule, regrettably, he is presenting th through Zoom from Australia. So,、uh, please, give, please give a hearty round of applause for Director Sugiyama. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so、uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity for making the address. And、uh, also, please allow me to、uh, make the welcome address from the Australia. Now I am in the,、uh, Brisbane. Uh, attending the, some very important、uh, collaborative meetings in the University of Queensland. And、uh, as a director of the Mind Institute ARCAS, I am very honored to make the, some very brief greetings、uh, to all the attendees, and especially、uh, Ms. Cameron uh, for uh, 
making a very important uh, presentation uh, in this uh, symposium. So I heard that the, this is the, on the safety of the uh, artificial intelligence, AI. Yes, that's a quite, uh, say, important, convenient, and also the debatable topic. Because the uh, AI actually give us the uh, much more, how to say, opportunity uh, to extend our wisdom and uh, to extend our horizon of the uh, exploration of the many aspects. But uh, as uh, everybody uh, get, uh, gathering here knows, the AI is anonymous. And the information which we get from AI is not uh, sure. Although uh, it is uh, quite abundant and convenient. So the point is that how to uh, get a good collaboration with AI. I myself is a fan of the AI, and I asked also the students uh, getting my course uh, to make a report on the basis of the uh, answer getting from AI and ask the students uh, to append some criticism uh, to that uh, report uh, got, uh, which the student get uh, from AI. So such kind of the, say, credibility of the information is not ensured by AI alone. So my opinion is that it's very important to complement such uh, instability or the danger of the AI by human wisdom and human trust. I think that this is uh, one of the topics which will be developed in this workshop or symposium. But anyway, the, as the director of the Institute, uh, which gathers quite a diverse uh, discipline uh, inside of the University of Tokyo, and also uh, the Institute, uh, which is very eager to make uh, international collaboration with not only the pure scientific entity, but also some uh, new activities uh, which bridges the uh, science and policy. I do expect that the, uh, the collaborative framework read by uh, Professor Igata will uh, take a leading role through the uh, very effective international collaboration uh, um, bridging the uh, science, technology, and also the political advocacy side. So uh, I'm very sad uh, not being able to attend this very interesting, important symposium, but I do expect that uh, we will have a very fruitful outcome, probably not the conclusion, uh, but the uh, some uh, new clue to discuss about the uh, new horizon to make the most effective and the wisest use of the AI and also keep the security of the uh, information which incorporates both the wisdom from the artificial and real intelligence uh, which is supported by human trust. So uh, that's my uh, comments and I just let the uh, audience and also the uh, moderators uh, to facilitate the uh, very exciting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Sugiyama. So now it is my dis distinct honor to introduce today's moderator and uh, organizer of this, this symposium, Professor Akira Igata, special lecturer at the Archist. Uh, Professor Igata holds multiple distinguished positions, uh, in including that of senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, CIN or CINAS, in Washington, D.C. Senior Fellow at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPI, in Canberra. Beyond these roles, uh, Professor Igata uh, provides more invaluable advice to various levels of the Japanese government, uh, ministries, and the private sector organizations. So, uh, Professor Igata, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Akira Igata here from the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technologies. Um, I see a few familiar faces uh, from last week since I hosted the Japan ROK Economic Security Dialogue, but uh, here we are today again now talking about the topic of AI, standardization, and Japan-UK cooperation. 
So uh, this event is uh, not only host hosted by our institute and the British Embassy in Tokyo, but I also want to extend the gratitude uh, for our, uh, to those who have supported this event, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, Cybersecurity Strategy Headquarters of Japan, and Keio University. Um, since we don't have much time, very quickly, um, I want to introduce you a little bit about uh, what we do here at ESRP, or the Economic Security Research Program. Um, I have been trying to push for the international institutionalization of this program by trying to host these kind of public symposiums using mostly in English with simultaneous interpretation so that the Japanese government, private sector, the public, students can better engage in the international discussions going on on important topics regarding economic security issues. I also want to note that um, you may have noticed that there are students at the gate, students here actually being the MC. They're all undergrads and graduate students of University of Tokyo and our affiliated uh, friends. So um, we are now starting up this Young Leaders Program for the Economic Security Research Program. Um, not only do these uh, students help with the organization of these events, but uh, we're, we'll be hosting a workshop for these young folks. For example, uh, next week, we'll be hosting a Japan-US Young Leaders Dialogue where it's not us, I'll be serving coffee and water, right? It'll be the students working on the uh, working as a panelist, moderating, and so on. So those of you in this room uh, at University of Tokyo or from other universities who are interested in perhaps being part of this Young Leaders Program, uh, please, uh, after this event, come talk to me or talk to one of the students who is today organizing this event. So with that, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll be taking plenty of time at the end for Q&A, so please take lots of notes and uh, get ready to ask questions. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Igata. Uh, next, we would like to introduce our esteemed uh, guest keynote speakers for the, today's events. The CEO of the UK National Cybersecurity Center, Ms. Lindy Cameron, please give her a round of, round of applause. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Cameron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed uh, for having me. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Igata Sensei and his team from the University of Tokyo for inviting me here today and allowing me to talk to you about cybersecurity in a time of generative AI. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here in Japan to meet you and to see our Japan UK cybersecurity partnership agreed under the historic Hiroshima Accord go from strength to strength. Japan should be rightly proud of the Hiroshima process which brought together the global technology community to set its intentions to make AI work, both for our people and our societies. That helped set the scene for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's AI summit at the historic Bletchley Park in November. And I have to say, it was incredibly special to be at Bletchley Park with a group of people who were so in awe of being um, at one of the historic centers of dawns of technology, and I think it really felt like a special moment of being at a, at a place in time which had both been historic in the past, but was also really a historic meeting point, I think, between governments and the private sector to try and wrestle together how it was we approached the real challenge of regulating and the challenge of approaching AI at the current present. Because the world in 2024 is not getting any easier to navigate. And indeed, it's something that my successor will face head on when they take over my job. Um, in a couple of months' time, because I am actually now coming to the end of my role as the CEO of the UK's National Cybersecurity Centre. And in fact, this visit to Japan, and indeed also to South Korea, was one of the last things I wanted to do, because it felt like so much had changed in the last few years. It was important to really celebrate the friendship and the partnership that we've had between the UK and Japan, as we both have tackled the challenges of the past, but I think tackle some of the even bigger challenges of the future. I'm lucky to say that my successor, whoever they are, will have one of the best teams in the cybersecurity business ready to support them as they chart their course. And I also know we'll have the fantastic partnership that we have with Japan, as we defined in the UK-Japan Cyber Partnership refer referenced in the Hiroshima Accord. This partnership really is important to us, and it's already delivering results. We've seen the joint secure by design guidance and guidelines for secure AI system development, and indeed the recent memorandum of cooperation which was signed during the recent visit of Japan's Kaidenren Cybersecurity Committee to the UK. 
We really hope that that will help to deepen not only the government-to-government -government partnerships, but also the public-private partnerships, both within and between the UK and Japan. So back then to the challenge of artificial intelligence. The whole field of generative artificial intelligence is developing at pace. And I think one of the challenges is that it is developing at pace both within the technology community, but also at pace, it is gripping the imaginations of the public across the world. Which is why that summit at Bletchley Park was so important. Like the Hiroshima process, it brought together key countries from across the world and allowed the global technology community to come together and have a conversation and set our intentions to make AI work for our people and for our societies. And that then allowed us, as the National Cybersecurity Center, along with our partners in the US, in CISA, but also our partners here in Japan, both at NISC and at the Council for Science, Technology and Innovation, to launch collectively, co-sealing, the guidelines for secure AI system development, which were intended to give a framework to ensure that this technology is developed, deployed and operated in a secure and responsible way. Because AI is the latest challenge in technology, but in many ways it shares many of the characteristics of both technology of the past, but our approaches to technology of the past. And what we particularly want to avoid is repeating some of the mistakes that we previously made. We want to learn from that and do better. Because with new technologies come new challenges, but actually some old vulnerabilities both in frontier models and indeed in foundation AI models. Adversarial attacks, such as prompt injections or data poisoning attacks, have the potential to do real harm. We're also seeing the decentralization and democratization of what was previously very high-end software engineering, previously confined to only those organizations and nation states that could afford it and make best use of those skills, but now much more readily available, both with the huge potential to do good, but also with the challenge of appreciating some of the risks that come with that very rapid adaptation. We're seeing the rapid propagation of these tools and capabilities, and look just as an example at how fast ChatGPT caught the imagination of the general public all over the world. I have to say, it didn't totally surprise my team, but the challenge was to trying to help them imagine what that felt like to people who had not been as closely involved in understanding technology. There are some real positives to take from that, the widespread use of popular large language models, though I imagine it's quite a challenge for professors at universities, but there are, of course, opportunities for open source or subverted models to be taken advantage of, used for mal malicious ends, such as spreading disinformation, such as the more rapid uptake of malware, for example, something that we and many other countries are grappling with next year, uh, sorry, this year, as indeed, for example, we hold national elections in the UK, in the US, in India, and in many other nations. We're also then worried about the standard range of cybersecurity threats, so I won't rehearse them here, but in a sense, this layers on top a set of, of a set of both known issues that we've dealt with and a set of known challenges in technology. So that's potentially a pretty imposing to-do list. So where are we focusing? What are we worrying about, basically? I think there is a real risk that with AI, what we end up doing is posing a set of hypotheticals. It is quite difficult to predict what will happen, but I think there are known increases in the scale of capability, which we can, to some extent, predict in the next few years. We don't know exactly how AI capabilities will grow and develop, but we do know that they will, and we do know that from a cybersecurity perspective, it's really important to keep pace, not only with those changes, but also to help the public understand how they should respond to it whether that's actually helping model developers and technology companies build security into the models, or whether that's helping companies and individuals understand the kind of risks that they're taking as they adopt them. So from a cybersecurity perspective then, I think that as we begin to face that challenge, the first thing to say is that there is a real foundational approach that we are taking. We here, our partners in the US, our partners here in Japan, but across the, universe, across the international community, we advocate a secure by design approach to software in general. We believe that vendors really need to take responsibility for embedding cybersecurity into their technology and indeed into their supply chain from the outset and then through a system's whole life cycle. It's a mistake that we've made before and that we really must learn from. We are still paying the price for not having done that in previous generations of technology. And we believe that doing that then will help society and organizations realize the benefits of AI advances, but also help to build trust that AI is indeed safe and secure to use, 
and allow the right kind of public debate about where it is that we need to have a wider conversation about how it's deployed. We know that far too often, security can be a secondary consideration. It's a real temptation to race to market, particularly when the pace of development is so high. But we absolutely think that taking the time to build in really good security is completely vital. Much of that digital architecture we rely on today was never really designed with security at its heart. It was built for speed and scale with foundations that are, to be honest, somewhat flawed and vulnerable, and has left us in the cybersecurity community with quite a lot of work to do at times. So we ask developers not only to really build security in from the beginning, but also to the best of their abilities to predict the kind of possible attacks that might occur and indeed think through the ways to mitigate them. Again, this is a consistent approach to how we propose that any software developer thinks about the way that they evolve technology they're offering. Because the failure to do so risks designing vulnerabilities into future AI systems, building another flawed ecosystem and unwittingly making the challenges of technology in the future harder for us all, rather than allowing us to utilize the opportunities it offers. Alongside this, then, there's a question of data security. It's really vital, I think, that developers properly recognize the value of the training data that they use, making sure it's appropriately protected and indeed actually well understood. That protection is not a one-off moment in time. It has to be ongoing and must keep pace as things change. That's particularly important where sensitive data is involved, particularly when we consider the implications of a breach or indeed of misused information. And we also need to consider that AI is shifting our perception of what constitutes intellectual property. We've seen the debate um, around uh, the Actors Guild in the US, the sense of who is it that owns the rights to some of this uh, creative property. We need, to import, we need to ensure that debate continues to keep pace with the technologies it develops. We need to think about the model weights, for example, which are now considered intellectual property themselves and need to be secured as tightly as other vital proprietary information. So it really is changing the way we think about the use of data in this system. So how do we start to grapple some of these issues? At NCSC, we're really committed to working in partnership with our international counterparts. And one of the great successes, I think, has been that we were able to get such a wide range of international partners to co-seal the guidance that we put out. We wanted to signal that this is not an area on which there are really split or mixed views in the cybersecurity community. This is an area on which we pretty much all agree in the basics. It was an extraordinarily wide range of countries, but also of partners. There's a real universality. This is not a moment to pick apart different regulatory regimes. It's a moment to really reinforce the basics and then tackle the challenges collectively from there. So as well as working with our international counterparts, we also want to work with the private sector and indeed actually with the wider public sector for us in the UK to realize the benefits provided by artificial intelligence in general, but also by machine learning specifically. Because we know in cybersecurity that AI has the potential to improve cybersecurity. It potentially dramatically increases the timelines and accuracy of almost everything that we're able to do. Threat detection and response, for example. We've previously published guidance on machine learning to help developers to gain a better understanding of the kind of threats and vulnerabilities that some systems face so they can make informed decisions at an organizational level. And we're continuing to, to, to work together with our international partners in particular to ensure our guidance keeps pace with the development of technology. It's not a small challenge. I was talking to my team about the challenge they have of anticipating the timing of the evolution of this technology and then actually when it is we think people will most need next generations of guidance to help them approach it. We particularly need to think through how we put out guidance not just for technology developers and those who understand it, but actually for non-technical audiences, whether that's the boards of companies that are making decisions about what technology to use, as well as the developers who create it, whether that's managers who need to understand whether using AI increases or decreases risks, as we ourselves are thinking about the fact that AI can help us in the speed and, speed and pace of what we do in the same way it can also help our adversaries. So we'd really like to see the wider cybersecurity community playing a role in communicating the cybersecurity risks and implications of AI to developers and users so people can respond to them in really meaningful ways. So to conclude, I think there is a real risk that the conversation around artificial intelligence sometimes gets quite excitable. 
um, the existential impacts are hard to miss. We can't miss, however, I think in the middle of that, the real practical and quite predictable steps that we need to take in cybersecurity to help make sure that the current generation of AI, but actually in the very rapidly oncoming future generations of AI, are secure as they arrive and secure as they are deployed and remain secure in the future. It won't be easy to do that, I think. Um, the dramatic benefit that AI brings to our economies and societies is obvious, but the improvement in security it could bring is potentially equally important. So I would say to you, cybersecurity is fundamental to AI. You can't have AI safety without good AI cybersecurity. And this is not a conversation that I think is going to happen once and then stop. It's a conversation we need to continue because that security needs to continue to be built into the technology. The conversation, of course, you know, started at the summit, but it won't end there. It will continue at future summits and continue, I think, in all of these, these forum hallways. We must work together, therefore, to stay ahead of the risks. And although I will have handed on the role to somebody else, I'm really delighted that the UK's National Cybersecurity Centre, in partnership with a lot of our friends and colleagues internationally, including here in Japan, will be at the forefront of making sure we understand the cybersecurity threats that we face in AI, the cybersecurity opportunities that we have to use that technology for good, but the way it is that we can use this moment of debate around technology to drive home better practices on software and hardware development in general, working closely with our partners and indeed with industry to take the prosperity opportunities this offers, but also increase our collective security as we go. So I'm really looking forward to the debate here this afternoon, uh, both with the fantastic panel and indeed actually to hearing your questions from, from the floor. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ms. Cameron. This is the end of the keynote speech session. Shortly after setup, we will, uh, we will move to the panel discussion. Professor Igaten, our guest, uh, please make your way to the stage. Now we will transition to the panel discussion. Firstly, let me introduce our esteemed guest, uh, guest panelist. First, uh, we have Director Mina Takasawa, Director for uh, Governmental Affairs at Microsoft Japan Company Limited. Continuing on Professor Naoya Take, uh, Takeishi, elucid elucidating the methodology of statistical machine learning at Arcast. Lastly, we have Professor Daisuke Kawaii studying uh, emerging technologies and national, na and national security at Arcast. Please give a warm round of applause to the guests, please. Thank you so much, Tomizawa-san, for that wonderful MC. So before we go any further, I just want to check with the interpreters. Um, how are we doing? Are we in a... Do you want me to slow down a little bit? or A little bit? Oh, way down. Okay, so <laughs> let's try and uh, Sorry, speak slowly. <laughs> I'm usually guilty of that as well, so uh, I'll try to speak slowly as well. So uh, today, what we have for you here is an interesting panel, I think, because we have the private sector, the AI researcher from the academia, and then more about policy researcher. So we have a good mix of different views on this issue of AI, and we were chatting a little bit on backstage, but it looks like everyone has a little bit of a different perspective. So uh, hopefully this would be a fruitful debate. Um, so my first question probably goes to everyone on the panel, and that is on balancing the two risks. Two risks. What are the two risks? Of course, the easy risk is the abuse and misuse of this uh, AI technology, of course. But the other risk is that uh, if we regulate this new technology too much, then I think we would be losing a great opportunity uh, where a technological development could have saved lives. Um, I think the easy uh, example of this would be in the field of uh, medical research. Of course, we have to be careful that if we are to use AI on big data to do anal analysis on, let's say, patient data, then we have to anonymize all of the data. But if, for some reason, something goes wrong and all of this private patient's data goes out, then that's a catastrophe. 
So there is a good reason to create some kind of a guideline or rules to regulate it. But then on the other hand, if we regulate it too much, we're gonna be slowing the development of the technology and the use of all of this analysis, which means that perhaps if we were going full in on all of this without any regulation, perhaps we would have found a cure to uh, incurable disease that could have saved lives. So with that in mind, my first question is, how do you assess and balance these two risks? Uh, do you feel like in the UK, and of course it's really hard to quantify this, but would you say that the UK is more towards regulation or more towards promotion? And then my question to the panelists is, what about the sense of the field in where you are, in the private sector, in the academia, in the policy world? Promotion, regulation, go. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'll ask the interpreters to sort of wave at me again if I'm going too fast. Excellent. Um, so I think in the UK, we see the massive opportunity that AI presents. This is incredibly exciting. It's possibly one of the most exciting technological developments in, in my lifetime. And I think it is a huge opportunity there for the taking. But I think our approach is to be really clear-eyed about the fact that it will be much more of an opportunity if we drive security in from the beginning and if we are very, very realistic about the risks. So I think between ourselves and the NCSC looking at cybersecurity, but also with the AI Safety Institute evaluating the safety of some of these models, we are saying this is a technology that has massive opportunity, but we mustn't be naive about a potential for it to be abused, and we must really understand it. There is a sense of real responsibility. This has got a power and a weight that is beyond what we've seen in previous technologies, and therefore it is, it is more important that we have thought through what it has the possibility to do. We understand how it could go wrong. But these are things we ask everybody to do, but, but in a sense, in a, it, it feels less load-bearing. Now it is, it, is, it is important and load-bearing. So I think we are not in a sort of heavy-handed regulation approach. We are more in an approach of being very realistic about what the possibilities are, very, very very excited about the possibilities, very realistic about the potential threats, very realistic about the ways that we have got technology development wrong in the past and the need to absolutely make sure we don't re repeat those mistakes. So I think we are firmly on the side of seeing opportunity, but being super realistic about the pot potential for this to, to go wrong and therefore the need to, to ask quite a lot of developers as they, as they put this technology out to market it cannot be that people simply um, simply do this irresponsibly. It's got to be responsible technology development, well evaluated, reasonably transparent and well understood in a way that then allows our countries and citizens to make the most of the opportunity. Thank you so much. So uh, Lindy was talking about how AI is a really excitable topic and I'm really excited. And uh, I think I was too excited because I forgot I was supposed to have five minutes opening remarks from each of the speakers and then ask questions. So why don't we have the five minutes opening remarks from each of the speakers and then go back to the first question. <laughs> Thanks, Mina. So um, first I'd like to, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize that at Microsoft we greatly support and uh, appreciate the Japanese government and UK government's initiative uh, in order to ensure the uh, regulatory framework on AI, uh, Hiroshima AI process from Japanese government, and the guidelines for safe uh, AI development from the British government, uh, which was indeed endorsed uh, by dozens of partner countries, including Japan. And so, Indeed, I was thinking about making my com comments about the promotion and regulation. So my comments is related to that question as well. And uh, so as a tech company, uh, we also, again, uh, echo what uh, Lindy said about the, the AI. AI would bring a huge opportunity to the societies and economies of both UK and Japan and the whole of the world. And. Uh, when we think about risks and regulations, uh, we have to think about uh, it from, from the point of view of how we, ma we can maximize the power of AI. We don't think about regulation for the sake of regulation. And uh, from that point of view, uh, as, uh, as Lindy said, when we think about foundational models, uh, the, 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 the foundational, the, the level of requirements or safety standards that foundational model should meet should be uh, really high. And 
uh, in this regard, the Hiroshima AI process uh, did a great uh, did a great work to make sure the, the to, to set the baseline for these requirements. And but the thing is, uh, <coughs> and uh, but the AI doesn't stop at the level of foundational model. And when we think about the AI, which is applied in specific context or in the use cases, it's, it's another layer, it's another technology, technology layer of AI, it's deployment level. And uh, throughout past year, the governments and private sectors have very intensive uh, discussions about the foundational models and how we, we should make sure that this foundational model would meet uh, the high standards. And building upon this the past year achievement, I think we should start thinking about expanding the scope of safety standards to this deployment level, uh, because indeed it's this, in this deployment level is where uh, the most harms to the specific individuals or communities could materialize. So that's my comment, and I also I, uh, responded to part of your questions. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Naoya-san? Thank you. Um, I would remark a bit, a bit from purely academic point of view because I'm a purely academic uh, machine learning researcher. I'm not surely an expert uh, of political or uh, societal problems, but I would say um, the one thing I noticed is that there is a kind of large discrepancy between academic, purely academic community and more like AI safety or something um, like these discussions. Uh, because as an academist, um, usually we do not think about safety or <laughs> those kind of things uh, very often. Well, in the in, in machine learning community, it is, of course, it is um, being uh, regarded as something very important, of course, but um, in usual research activities, it is much less uh, prioritized. I would say like third, fourth, fifth prioritized uh, stuff. But um, this makes, um, what I feel is like this discrepancy makes uh, it difficult to define what is security, what is goodness uh, for society. So we need to uh, define these things, let's say, mathematically, in order to solve uh, these kind of problems from technical point of view. But in order to define these things mathematically, we need to know what is required, what is desired by society or for air safety. So, but this point is not really well discussed, I would say, because of this uh, discrepancy of community. So I would um, urge that uh, we need to communicate more between uh, pure scientific uh, communities and uh, more soci societal uh, communities. Yes, and the second point um, is that we need to be aware of what will appear next. I mean, we are currently more interested in something based on languages or images, like chat GPTs or some other uh, image generation AIs. We are currently mainly uh, concerned about these things. But um, I think in next decades, um, AI or machine learning will deal with more diverse kind of data sets, kind of uh, problems. For example, like in industrial sectors, more and more data are accumulated from many sensors attached to, let's say, factories or artificial satellites, vehicles, something like that. So these data are more and more accumulated right now, and in 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 a few year, in a few years, I would say um, some big AI models, machine learning models, will appear to predict or do something uh, about these these kind of problems data. So. We are not really, um, I think we are not really aware of possible potential risks uh, in these kind of uh, machine learning uh, based, machine learning based systems. And I think these things are more difficult 
to discuss because we cannot really read the sensor data directory in, 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 with, our, with our eyes, right? Uh, but we cannot, uh, sorry, uh, we can read the languages, we can see the images, what it represents. It's more, much more human friendly, but in, uh, when, when it comes to such sensor data, it's, it's much less human friendly, which, makes, um, which will make the discussion about safety much more difficult. So this is a yeah, kind of point of view I would suggest uh, from a purely academic research point of view. Thank you so much. Uh, your point about the next wave of AI where we're looking more at this industrial data I thought was interesting because you're right, at the moment everyone's talking about chat GPT and mid-journey and all of that, but you know where the money is, it's the industrial data. So uh, Daisuke-san, of course uh, you're in the academia, but you're also looking at this from the policy issue. What do you think? Yeah, um, the first of all, um, please let me offer my deepest gratitude to uh, uh, Ms. Lindy Cameron for uh, the, her fascinating keynote speech. And I want to uh, wish every fortune in her next appointment as well. And I also would like to express my honor as a, a former British Council scholar um, of being the same panel as uh, her. Uh, second, I'm not, a, as mentioned, I'm not an AI engineer, um, but rather a policy researcher. So as such, I approach this topic from the point of view of the general safety of AI. And on this basis, I fully agree with uh, the Lindy's speech and that uh, we need to build security uh, from the bottom up rather than an afterthought. So this right includes the data sharing capabilities such as um, threat analysis and uh, system weakness. So as mentioned, the Japan is the forefront of a discourse of AI safety, and uh, Japan's outlook on AI is summarized by Hiroshima Air Press, uh, Process, as we discussed. That, that is the G7's AI principles and the code of conduct. So these build on the OECD's AI principles and um, global partnership for artificial intelligence, uh, just for your reference, as a common point of, um, for, uh, for the reference for bills and the legally binding rules. And uh, the main advisory principle is a risk-based approach um, of AI as a lifestyle. So this involves uh, taking precautionary measures before implementation, as well as uh, continuous monitoring to reduce um, errors and misuse. So this also includes uh, promoting robust security controls and the public reporting of AI capabilities to increase accountability and uh, transparency and safety. So beyond the risk assessment, the AIP COC, the Code of Conduct, identify the priority areas for R&D. These may be data, um, data rights or mitigation of uh, societal risks and uh, addressing global challenges. Now, however, since this is emerging technology, new technology, many areas still need to uh, clarification. So if, for example, the definition of a terminology and uh, incident categorization or taxonomy and uh, benchmarking risk and uh, helping users identify AI-created content are just some of the novel challenges that are envisioned. So there are other constellations such as uh, public liability and uh, creating secure mechanism for risks and, um, um, and the information sharing or AI safety and the system it's itself the vulnerability. So all of these elements are part of the work on consensus on the international technical standards the, um, for AI, which Japan recognizes the AI safety and the system vulnerability. And uh, also recognizes that these, there needs to be a greater alignment, which is uh, very important. They're looking at the parallel process. The, they're currently taking a place globally, Japan understands the views on AI framework in regards to the adaptation and the regulations and, and are evolving and divergent. So we also understand why we must stay ahead of these technologies 
And the critical part of this is how the major AI developers, technologies, and knowledge will shape national AI framework in the long run. So in particular, there um, seems to be a lot of misunderstanding, as mentioned, in the public space and about what AI to can or can't do. So this requires technical expert knowledge like uh, that, that of Takei Sensei has, and uh, to clarify its limit and uh, potentiality. And uh, however, this does not mean the private sector um, has a complete freedom to set the agenda, you know. And uh, as, uh, as uh, um, the Lindy introduced the AI Security Summit, and uh, where he, uh, Prime Minister Rishi Snack made a great presentation, but he also mentioned that we cannot rely on them to mark their own homework. At, so I think which is a definitely the right word. And in short, Japan knows we need to uh, work together on producing the beneficial AI tools and um, to overcome the general uncertainty um, around AI technologies such as um, both real and uh, perceived. The especially we need to develop a shared understanding of uh, risks to create the new laws. So in Japan's case, it's evolving AI guidelines being finalized by AI Strategy Council, our AI Strategy Council, and based on my understanding, the basis of its strategic concept is irresponsible AI. So I'm also aware that the AI Council of Japan is keen to ensure the politics does not, does not stifle innovation. Then lastly, on a personal note, the my security concerns about AI extending to lethal autonomous weapons or the future risks of laws, as well as the dangers AI poses to our democracies in terms of a spread of fakes, uh, disinformation, and uh, propaganda, as which uh, Lindy also mentioned before. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope um, my comment wouldn't be too much robotic like ChatGPT. Thank you. Thanks, Daisuke. So uh, before going to the next round of questions, uh, Lindy, do you have anything you want to respond to or? Uh... Thank you, technology, eh? <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I, I think the points about the fact that we're currently in an era where generative AI is the thing that has caught the imagination of the public um, I think the speakers are absolutely right. Um, there's a much wider range of potential uses. You know, I think in many ways, the summit in uh, the autumn focused quite a lot on the frontier models and imagining the very biggest extent of what these will be possible because we need to start thinking now. I think um, one of you, I'm afraid I can't remember who, sort of suggested that, in fact, I think it was, it was, it was you, sir, suggested that researchers need to understand what society wants. And I think part of the challenge is society doesn't know what it wants yet because it doesn't understand the potential of what the technology can do. So we have a sort of iterative loop where people who understand the technology have to explain what it can do in a way that allows a public debate in society about whether that's acceptable, but then actually gives a level of moral or strategic context to researchers to think about whether they are developing technology within the parameters of what is acceptable to society. And we should recognize also that that will vary across societies. You know, the debate on free speech, for example, and privacy is very different in the US, in the UK, in Europe, in Japan, because of all of our different histories. And so I think that, that you know, I sometimes find, I run an organization filled with technology experts who are slightly baffled by why it is that people have taken so long to understand the potential of AI. And I have to keep reminding them that actually, Part of our job is to explain the technology, not just to understand it. And I think, therefore, for me, communication and debate like this is incredibly important because it's only that, that way that we will get to a really healthy balance of society being excited by the opportunities, not too scared by the prospects, and actually a, an appropriate balance of regulation where we really need to, but not where it constrains opportunity. So, helpful debate. Thanks so much. Uh, I must admit that I have trouble getting my uh, settings right on my microwave, so it's going to be really hard to understand the AI and everything. But uh, I want to build a little bit on what you just said. And sorry, guys, I'm going to go off the script uh, already. But um, so you talked about the importance of uh, cooperation with the industry. You talked about the importance of working with the researchers. But then uh, during your tenure, 
what worked and what didn't work with regards to this type of a public-private partnership, whether it's the private sector or the academia, because I think it's a little bit different in each country, but there are commonalities like the ones that you mentioned, which is that it is a really technical issue, so it's really hard to communicate in the first place. So yeah, what worked, what didn't work? So I think what we found in the UK, in the National Cyber Security Center, is that um, the most important thing that works is, is government being quite humble about what it can do and what the private sector can do. We have made huge strides in our cybersecurity by being much more open to sharing data between ourselves and the private sector. So for a long time, government kept its secrets secret and the private sector complained that basically it didn't know what government was doing and government, I think, undervalued and underestimated what the private sector could do. We have found massive benefit by sharing and we share very openly. So we are quite a strange organization in that we are both the very public face of the UK cybersecurity, and we are very proud to be part of our intelligence agency, which is very, very well governed and very tightly regulated to make sure that what we do is for the benefit of the UK public. Um, and we therefore have thought through very carefully how it is that we make sure we only take on data that we need to have responsibly, but we share data really openly where we can with the private sector. And we found that we worked with a set of private sector cybersecurity companies who were far more capable than I think we had realized, had a vast amount of understanding of the threat. And that allowed us to really focus only on the very highest end of what government needed to do. So in some ways it meant actually government got out of the way of the private sector. It allowed the private sector to do what it was capable of doing and actually to, to, you know, to be economically successful while doing it. But it also allowed us to add value as the, as the public sector to that. So I think for me that the thing that's really worked is continuously being willing to take a bit more risk on sharing information and on really talking to a wider group of people than we necessarily imagine. So for example, we have a scheme called I-100 um, which is a scheme where we have um, a whole set of individuals from the private sector who work inside my organization. My American colleagues are baffled by the fact that we only make them sign a very short seven-page agreement to do this. <laughs> they can't imagine how the contract is sh so short. I think in the US it would be much longer. Um, but we have a, a high-level agreement that means that they as individuals, not representing their companies, but understanding what their companies know, come and work with us as government. And it gives us this fantastic benefit of individual brilliance and expertise and research, the private sector's wider understanding of the context and of the market, and then the public sector's sort of understanding, in particular, I think, of some of the more sophis sophisticated state threats that we see in the national security picture. So that's the bit that's really worked, is being open to sharing, exchanging information. What hasn't worked, I think we faced more of a challenge during COVID of doing that, partly because that actually a lot of that requires quite high levels of trust, and it's easier to do face-to-face -face than it is to do, I think, virtually. Um, but also, I think, um, what has also been tricky is to get right the balance of where government regulates and where it doesn't. So there's quite a wide debate in cybersecurity around whether you go, for example, for, I mean, this is something Michael's very familiar, mandatory reporting. So that Australia and the US have imposed a level of mandatory reporting. Um, that poses quite a high regulatory burden, and it has a risk of making companies spend a lot of time deciding whether they need to report or not, rather than running to us quickly and saying, we've got a bit of a problem, can you help us understand it? Um, so I think there's been quite a debate that's not always been too successful in working out, are we doing too much or too little as government? And I think that's something we're still working through and trying to decide where we set the bar at the right level. So I think that your point about data sharing and trust is have uh, important implications to the discussion that we're having now in a uh, adjacent area of the security clearance system in Japan, where we're now trying to think about expanding the security clearance to the private sector for economic security related information, however, that's going to be defined. Uh, the bill is uh, probably going to be introduced uh, during the uh, end of this month. And uh, it might have both effects, right? Um, government might be able to trust more of those private sector folks who have had their background checked and had security clearances. But then that might mean that the government would be unwilling to share some of those data, which would have probably openly shared with others. But now, because of this institution, they may not share it with anyone who doesn't have security clearances. So maybe there's something that the economic security sector can learn from this discussion. But with that, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, Mina, do you have any comments from the private sector on this point? And I'm reminding myself to please speak slower. Mina, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, like public-private cooperation is uh, emphasized, so is emphasized in, in many in many domains, and AI is no exception. I'd like to reiterate the importance of public-private partnership. 
And I'd like to emphasize this again because uh, although it's a very uh, common, common word, but it's because uh, like internet, AI has been around, around for a while already. AI itself is not a very new technology, uh, but AI is, has been developed and designed and developed and deployed by private companies. So we are leading this area. And indeed, uh, uh, for example, as Microsoft, we have we recognized the serious risk that uh, AI could pose to the society uh, from quite a long time ago already, like 10 years ago, and we established our internal system to make sure that AI could act and uh, operate responsibly. And we have an internal process, internal tools, and the internal and governance mechanism. And we would like to share that our, our experience to the government. Of course, we, we don't say that uh, we can copy and paste what Microsoft do to, to the government across the world, but we believe that our experience could be something valuable to governments as well. So yes, public-private partnership is a key. And thankfully, uh, throughout Hiroshima AI process or with other governments, we have been in a close collaboration with many governments and we would like to continue to do so. So it sounds like the public-private partnership is going good, uh, going well so far. But uh, I don't know, yeah, or Daisuke, do you want to talk about a little bit from the academic side, or are you okay? No, let's go with this. Okay, gotcha. So uh, this brings me to my uh, original question. Can, can, oh, I, can I come back to you, though, on the, on the issue about the private se uh, the um, security clearance for the private yes, sector? Yes, please. So, so I think it's really important. So we couldn't work the way we do without being able to security clear both individuals um, as, as individuals, but also as um, partners that we uh, use to outsource work to. So we've had a long-standing system where we are able to give security clearance to, to individuals, and actually that's part of what allows us to have different levels of trust. So, for example, there are people who um, have moved over the years to different organizations who we've cleared in their different roles, um, and it, it gives us a basis for sharing beyond government, and it means we get challenged, because the risk is if you don't have anybody outside government who understands what you know, you end up with a risk of groupthink, and a risk of, as you, I mean, as you say, Microsoft has been dealing with these, these issues for ages. In a sense, the private sector has a different perspective on this, and it's a really healthy challenge to have a different perspective. So I think it's fantastic that the government is looking at the ability to clear individuals. I think you're right, it's important to think through uh, the sort of potential second order consequences, so how to make sure those are not just the only individuals. So for example, um, we also have to think about how it is that we share information with our oversight and scrutiny bodies, because that's a very important part of the legal oversight that we have to make sure we can do what we do. And we also share information in trust groups. So we have a sort of equivalent process of deciding consciously how it is we release information beyond government to groups of people on a sort of similar basis, which is, we're sharing this with you, I and mean, this is the TLP system that we use in the, in a, you know, with, with the private sector, we're sharing this with you, but you can't share it with anybody else. Or we're sharing this with you on a very strict basis that says you and you only need to know this. And sometimes it's time sensitive, and sometimes it will always be sensitive. So we're, if, you, if you get into a position where you can explain more clearly why this information is restricted to a group, then it's easier to have a conversation, then it's easy to, easier to manage the risk. So I think it's fantastic because I think otherwise the risk is there's too big a divide between government and everybody else and you get a much less healthy debate. So I think it's a fantastic move. Thanks so much. Uh, speaking about uh, different type of risks, uh, disinformation. You talked a little bit about it. Uh, everyone's talking about it these days. I mean, to be honest, uh, we've had fake news and yellow journalism from back in the, I don't, I'm not a history expert, but decades and centuries ago. But I feel like with the, uh, the rise of generative AI, you have all of these fake news articles coming out by not tens of hundreds and thousands, but maybe millions every day. You've got these mimicking of uh, audio uh, that's actually artificial. You have deep, uh, deep fake videos that look so real. So basically what we're living in now is a, a world where potentially Everything is a uh, yellow journalism, but on steroids. What do you think is the fruitful area of collaboration between, let's say, Japan, UK, and other like-minded partners and allies in trying to tackle this uh, insidious problem of uh, disinformation fueled by generative AI? And this is to anyone on the panel. Uh, So regarding the disinformation issues, I think one of the areas we can cooperate between Japan and the UK is the language model patterns um, um, data set. 
So um, as you know, when it comes to the opponent countries, I wouldn't specify it which countries, but um, it has a several Asian language as well as English, right? And uh, we, we, if we have a, a certain amount of uh, the patterns of the um, words which, uh, which is used by the disinformation or deep fake uh, um, the production. The, if we have a, a certain amount of data set, we can analyze and we can uh, tell which are fakes or which are not the truth. So um, at least I think uh, the court and the G7s or these mechanism can work on that kind of a, um, maybe uh, fact check initiative sort of things uh, would be um, possible options we can work on. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else? So about this information, technically, I think it's always possible to um, to to put some some wrong information into the language model. It's it's always possible. There is, I think, no way to um, principally, uh, in principle, prevent all the disinformation possibilities. So um, one possibility, which is not perfect, but probably working possibility, is to make the language model open, uh, crystal clear, everything about the language model, so that people, other people, can test it uh, within their own settings. But for example, like ChatGPT, it's not open. Although it's, it's by OpenAI, it's not open, which is <laughs> a bit uh, strange. Uh, this, I think, is very problematic right now. Many people are using ChatGPTs, but we don't know what they are doing inside. Well, like, we know the principle, but we don't know the heuristic uh, control that uh, some, some guys possibly done in OpenAI behind the wall. So um, there need to be some incentive to make these models, language models, for example, open, I think, uh, in order to possibly prevent this information. This is uh, from a technical point of view. Thank you so much. Um, listening to that, I just remembered reading an article talking about how someone tried to make a similar kind of uh, AI language model, but the data was bad, so this uh, AI tended to be super racist, and they had to scrap it and make it from scratch, but uh, now listening to you, I appreciate uh, what's going on in the background more. Um, do you want to take this question as well? or? Uh? So I think this year is a really important year in disinformation because we have a number of election cycles in which we will see whether disinformation is a big issue or not. And I think particularly in, in the US, it's an important moment. I have to say I'm a bit of a skeptic on our ability to spot um, disinformation. I think the only direction this is going in is that it will get harder and harder. So again, in cybersecurity, I have to remind people that we are well past the moment where you will spot the spam email by the bad grammar or by the, you know, the, the obvious errors um, in it. People still think that they are, if they're just a bit clever, they will notice it. Uh, generative AI now means that you can get a beautifully worded, very grammatical email that you will never tell wasn't written by a human. And I think that it's important we think about this. There's clearly a public debate around things like watermarking, but I don't think we can rely on that. Mm -hmm. I think it is really important that we also understand the threat, so we understand where it is that people might intend to use this for harm, that we have an educated population who understands how all, all of our democracies work and therefore where it is you can shape opinion. For example, in the UK, we are much less worried about our electoral process because it's quite paper-based. It's actually quite difficult <laughs> to interfere with because it's quite old-fashioned, um, which is quite a good thing at this point. But on the other hand, like every society, we have a population who is quite influenced by what they read in social media. And so it is much easier to help shape people's opinion. And generative AI has made it much easier to do that at speed and at scale. So we are particularly worried that the ability to generate deep fakes that are very plausible very quickly in an election cycle is something people need to be aware of so that when they see that slightly unlikely video of a politician doing something silly, they think, hang on a second, is this really real or not? Because it's a short period of time in which that will have influence. And so it's important we have a public conversation about this before it's a problem, as well as once it happens in real life. And we know that there are 
some, some organizations, some criminal groups, some state actors who might be interested in using this. So it's important people understand that's an option and we have an educated conversation in advance about it. I worry a little bit that people think somehow organizations like us can help to identify this. I don't think there's a silver bullet or a magic answer that will help us now with that. I think we have to have the public debate and think about this as a human problem as well as a technology issue. I think the, uh, the biggest difficulty here is that we have seen so many times where politicians have actually done something really stupid, so we can't really think, huh, that politician did something stupid. It must be real. Um, but with that, uh, we have about 20 minutes. Uh, I want to open up to the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, please first identify yourself and then keep your questions very short and concise. Uh, please make sure that your question is at least shorter than our opening remarks. So uh, with that, uh, anyone, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. If not, I'm going to keep asking my own questions, which I'll be happy, but this time is for you. So please, if anyone wants to take a jab. If not, oh, there we go. Gentleman with the red tie. So English is better, right? So uh, my name is Ken Kadayama. I'm uh, working on digital policy at Toyota Motor Corporation. My question is to my colleague Mina about how Microsoft is going to prevent bias um, in, 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 in uh, generative AI, AI models. And, and as Mina thinks about her answer, I just wanted to relay my thanks to I see Carolyn and Chris uh, uh, in the front row uh, for their help on the UK, Japan, Japan mission, UK. I was one of the members on the mission. And if it's of any help to the panel, including yourself, um, uh, he, us at Toyota, we always keep people at the center, so to speak. So our company, when our company was founded in 1937, cars were made for people. So I always think the technology should be for people. And the other thing is that um, public-private partnerships should also include civil society. So um, uh, 50 years ago, we had 16,000 people who passed away from traffic accidents. Now in Japan, we have 3,000 people, unfortunately. Obviously, the less is better. But this is, in order to make traffic accidents more or less, it has to be effort by industry, government, and the people who drive the cars as well, too, to wear seat belts and not drink and drive. So I think I can sort of see that in the AI model as well, too, that you know, when we talk about safety, this is important as well. So I let you prepare me, san for your <laughs> answer about how is Microsoft going to prevent bias? Well, thank you very much for your questions. So about bias, of course, as a tech company, uh, we are developing a very different kind of technologies. And with the arrival of this uh, generative AI era, we, our, not me, but our te technical experts, uh, working hard to develop develop and um, sharpen our technology. For example, about the content moderation technology and filtering the, the, the information which is biased, which is relating to like a violent expression like that. And also we are working on the AI watermarking of AI, ge AI, generati AI generated content. Although as Lindy said, I agree that it's not a silver bullet. And about bias, and I, I think the, the discussion around bias is relating to the, the like uh, the, the election, for example. And it's I'd like to uh, echo what Rindy and another people said that it's it's about collective effort. I think tech companies should play their roles, and the government should play their roles, and civil society also have to be have to learn to to how to deal with AI, because AI will be a will become the ubiquitous technology in the near future. So yes, it's, uh, it's a collective, collective effort uh, as a society as a whole. And as a tech company, we, we, we believe that we have a huge responsibility. And our, our experts are doing their job. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I yeah, think as you. an academia, it's our job to facilitate that conversation. And we're doing it here now. So perfect. Um, any other questions, comments? The student in the back, I guess. And by the way, uh, there is simultaneous interpretation. So if you want to ask a question in Japanese, go ahead. But if you want to try in English, go for it. Thank you. 
AI 生成 AI を作っている会社というか、えっと、我々が使えるようになった AI を作り出したのはオープン AI だと思いますでそのオープン AI があるのはアメリカですでそうなると今のところ見てる限り一つの国のにある一つの会社が力を持って AI を作っている逆に日本で AI を、えー、と世界で使われるような、えー、作ってる会社はないっていう中でどう日本が、えー、と国として AI の規制を作っていくのかそしてイギリスとしてどのように AI の規制をしていくのか公としてどう、えー、とルールを作っていくのかそしてその会社も守ってもらえるようなルール作りをしていくのか逆に会社もどこができてどこができないのか守れないのか守れるのかってところがあるのであれば教えていただきたいなと思いますよろしくお願いします Good question So、uh, maybe Naoya san can start thinking about how whether it would be possible to have a Japanese domestic AI platform for these but while you think about that、um, I think I saw another hand that goes up somewhere in the middle yes Uh, I'm Ryo Tanambu.、Uh, I'm a graduate school of law and politics student of the University of Tokyo.、Uh, so I have, a I have a question about related to him. So, do you have any idea about the helpful or bad examples of regulations leading, poli regulations leading policies or pu、uh, public or private p a r t n e r s h i p about other technologies? For, for, for creating helpful,、uh, for creating bright future with AI. Thank you so much. So、uh, I'm not sure who can take this one, but、uh, maybe if there's one more question, s I'll take it and I'll go back to the floor. Yes, gentlemen in the middle. Oh, thank you for your speech. This time we focused on generative AI for large language models. But I think、uh, automatic and optimization functions is the most economically variable task. I believe optimization functions have a lower safety risk compared to generative AI. But are there any safety concerns regarding the optimization functions? And、uh, please identify yourself.、Ah, sorry, <laughs> my name is Hayato Hongo, and I'm a university student at Tokyo University. Fantastic. So, with those three questions,、uh, anyone want to start?、Um, usually, the first one to answer is good because you get to choose which one you want to answer. But,、uh, anyone, any takers? If not, sure. I can start if that's helpful. So, on the first question, then, the issue about、uh, the US domination of the, mar、uh, the market,、um, it's a really good question. And it's partly why our Prime Minister was so keen to have an international summit on AI last year because I think that. Um, they're not just US companies, but you're right, the majority of the big companies involved in frontier models are in the US. This is partly because, this, at the moment, the cost of entry to the market for frontier AI capability is so high. That cost will very rapidly change as the technology improves. And so I think part of what we should expect to see is that the market shifts quite dramatically in the next few years. Firstly, as people who get to the market early do well, and that's part of the risk. Is the incentives are very high to succeed early.、Uh, you want to be the Google of the future, not let's think of the names of companies we can't remember because they died early in the technology cycles of the past. So there are some strong incentives, but I think the market will shift as costs change. It's not just the US, but I think there are countries, there are countries who have some involvement. There are then countries that feel no power in this. So we were really keen at the summit to invite a wide range of countries, some of whom felt as if all the big decisions. About AI regulation could be taken outside their control, and actually to have that international debate, because it's not just a single country issue. This technology has the potential to go beyond borders and to influence what happens in, in every country. So it's really important there is an international debate around what risks it's acceptable for one country to impose on other countries by the way they regulate companies in their jurisdiction.、Um, so I think it is really important, and I think it was really exciting to see a wide range of countries represented at the summit. Expressing views about the potential risks. And one example, probably quite pertinent here, is that some of the training data the current models have used on is definitely biased towards English because of the, the bias within the internet in terms of, of the proportion of data in different languages. That's a big issue in any country that doesn't speak English. It's a really big issue if you're from a small country that speaks a minority language and if, if you have very little data on the internet in your language. And that's true, for example, in some parts of Africa. 
So I think that, you know, it's, it's that kind of public policy debate that we need to have to make sure that companies that are dominating the market act responsibly in the wider interest, that governments that regulate those businesses are thinking about how to act not only in their own interest, and that we're all thinking about how the market will change over time. Um, and I think that's a really healthy debate that we've seen and will continue to see. So I think Japan has a really important role to play. Um, Japan is a country that has been incredibly important in the development of technology um, over the last uh, decades. And I expect to see as very important in the evolution of technology in the years to come. So I think it's particularly important. There's a strong debate here about what's acceptable. And it's very exciting to be here at a moment when the debate on technology and national security feels like it's really at a moment of of changing some of the, the regulation for the future in a way that allows that debate to happen. So I'm very excited, but I think it's important that we recognize the potential bias in the geography as well. Thanks so much. Uh, anyone else want to take the second or the third question? If not, so I'll take the second one while someone think about the third one because I'm not sure what the safety uh, implications of the optimization process is, but I'm sure someone will. On your second question, um, I think you asked uh, about how, whether or not there has been a case where a regulation of AI has resulted in some kind of a, a suboptimal, suboptimal outcome. But uh, I believe that uh, with regards to the regulation on AI, it's not that widespread yet, right? But I think the bigger question here applies, and that is, has there ever been a case where a regulation on new critical and emerging technologies have had suboptimal outcomes? And perhaps one easy uh, case I can think about is on biotechnology issues. I mean, biotechnology and biomanufacturing is still developing today, but uh, so far we have seen many cases where um, there has been uh, a scientific consensus that something is safe, but because it looks very scary, uh, the policy went ahead and regulated certain things, which ended up in a suboptimal outcome. Um, what I have in mind, of course, is the uh, genetically modified food, for example. Um, in a way, what we eat has been slowly genetically modified anyways, right? And GM f GMO foods are usually, genetically modified foods are uh, just uh, uh, making that process faster and more precise. Uh, but because there has been this uh, uh, fear over biotechnology, um, I think many cultures and many uh, countries have decided to regulate the sales of these food. And the, the sad thing is that uh, certain products made by this process has been very nutritious, very uh, productive, very um, very cheap, and so on. Uh, please uh, try and look up uh, the story of the golden rice. Uh, you can look at both pro and for uh, of this. Um, yes, there was the issue that we talked about today about the communication from the scientists and the policy makers. And I think it's important to learn from these previous mistakes of other technology and regulation when we think about AI technology and regulation. Anyone wanna take the question on the optimization? Thank you, Naoya-san. So I, I understood the question as a potential danger or safety uh, issue about the optimization uh, of something uh, based on AI or something, right? Um, I would raise one point. It's about potential misspecification of optimization criteria because uh, the optimization criterion need to be defined very mathematically, purely mathematically way. And it, in, in most cases, it cannot express all the requirements from experts. It can only um, extract uh, important uh, aspects of what, could, what, what should be optimized in reality. So it cannot be, I think, perfect. And mm, the point here is that there is always sort of misspecification, and we need to be aware of this uh, misspecification and the pos potential of, let's say, mm, how to say, the wrong decision based on uh, the, that optimization. And here also comes the uh, issue of responsibility, because if the AI or optimization uh, decides something, who is responsible for that decision? That's the, that's the real um, risk or issue when uh, uh, d uh, applying this optimization to real problems, I think. And again, the openness of optimization or uh, optimization criterion uh, is very important here because uh, if the criterion was open, we can, uh, everyone can um, verify what was optimized and uh, what was result uh, due to that optimization. Yes. 
Thank you so much. Uh, this is why I love our institute, Research Center for Advanced Science and Technologies, because it's not just a policy folks, there's actually people who understand the sciences. So thank you so much for coming. So we have maybe four minutes left. If anyone else have a uh, last question they wanna ask, I can maybe take one or two. Going once, going twice, gone. So I'm going to give each presenters uh, one minute to summarize or say whatever you want, and we'll wrap it up after that. Mindy? Great, so I want to say thank you for having this debate today. I think you're absolutely right. It feels like a really important balance to have people who understand the deep technology, uh, the mathematics of this, and people who understand the human behavior. And I think that's the space we're in, is understanding that technology and people are going to keep on interacting um, the speed of that change, given where we are in the AI debate, is going to be really fast, and therefore it's even more important that we keep on having this debate. I'm a technology optimist, so I can think of lots of examples where the technology is exciting, but the public debate and the government intervention has made it safer for people, whether that's cars, whether that's actually, you know, sort of how, how we use for collective benefit, you know, telecoms, radio, I think, I think it's, it's, it's a really challenging debate, but it's a very healthy debate. Um, and I think it's very important we keep on having it. But I think it's also really important we do it internationally. I think that last point about the market really matters. And therefore, this isn't a debate that we can confine to any single country. It's something we need to have collectively, but recognizing the differences of opinion that might exist, the differences in perspective that we all have. So it's great to be here with friends from Japan having this debate here today. And uh, best of luck to the conversation here in the future. Thank you very much for having me today, first of all. And <coughs> uh, last, uh, the, the, the last thing I would emphasize is that um, uh, we, it's, it's, it's kind of easy to be terrified by the novel technology because we don't know really what it is about. But uh, it, is also, it is really important to focus on the positive aspect of this technology, especially, I think, because uh, in Japan, because Japan has, uh, Japan is a, is an aging society, so the population is decreasing, and in order to keep up, uh, keep up the economic development pace, uh, I think we need uh, some pro productivity boost, and AI could be a, a wonderful co-pilot. We we call we call generative AI co-pilot in Microsoft, and <laughs> AI could be a wonderful co-pilot for the productivity boost and the economic. Uh, economic development of Japanese society. So uh, with that, uh, th this is my last comment. Thank you. Not so subtle product placement, but it's okay. <laughs> no, yes, so thank you very much for having me today. It was a great opportunity for me to know the real excitedness about this issue. And it, it was very lucky for me to know the, this, this kind of um, real interest uh, of people on this issue because we are, as I said, uh, we are not really aware uh, of this uh, societal uh, point of view, uh, from academic point of view. And I would say, mm, yeah, that the, still the uh, discrepancy between uh, academic community, science community, and society uh, is there, and we need to somehow, uh, somehow fill it. And we are happy, I mean, we, we want some issues. We want to know, know what is problem, what is problem to be solved, because we are, we are scientists, we are researchers, and we are probably uh, good at uh, finding some mathematical, technical uh, definition of such issues. So, um, as Bindi uh, emphasized, uh, there, there is a need for communication uh, between, I mean, not between, but among larger, uh, wider range of people. So, this is what I learned from today. Um, being a part of the discussions, uh, the quest a question comes to my mind was, um, which kind of a framework would be better to promote our AI cooperation? I think uh, starting from G7 would be better, and then expanding to G20 would be ideal. Also, it also has another layer, which is data, as we discussed. The IPEF is uh, dealing with the data issues, and Japan promotes the data free flow with trust, which is under the debate among the nations, like-minded countries. So I think we also have needed to have uh, another session regarding data and also more security issues. Thank you very much for today's time.
Aisuke, Naoya, Mina, and Lindy, thank you so much for coming today. I think I, we all learned a lot. Please join me in a big applause for thanking the panelists. So last week, uh, promotion time, two weeks from now, February 21st from three o'clock to five o'clock, I am welcoming uh, four fantastic researchers from the Czech Republic and Taiwan. Now, uh, this person in Taiwan is actually Polish, so the topic is on Japan and Central Eastern Europe economic security co cooperation. I think this is gonna be exciting because if you look at the Central Eastern European countries, I guess our first thought is which countries are in the Central and Eastern Europe, right? Uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, what does Japan have to do anything with it? I think that because of the radical change in the international environment in the last couple of years, there's now a new area of potential collaboration between the CEE, once again, Central Eastern European countries and Japan, as so we're gonna be focusing on economic security issues and having the same thing, panelist discussions, moderated discussion, and then Q&A with the audience. So please, if you're available and interested, uh, I look forward to see you in, seeing you in two weeks. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you for your attentive participation. This concludes today's symposium. Please exit slowly through the rear door. And make sure you haven't left any belongings behind. And also for those who have simultaneous interpretation equipment, please ensure to uh, return it at the front desk. Thank you.